In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1.1. In six literal days, this world was created. And on the seventh day, God rested. On that sixth day, God created man. We find this in Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. When you come to Genesis chapter 2, you find almost an instant replay of what took place in chapter 1. And we read about uh, the man that God created. In Genesis chapter 2, beginning in verse 18, if you have your Bibles, I invite you there. It says that the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field, every bird of the air, and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. Whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And so the, from, from the beginning of time, we see God's plan for the home, don't we? We see that the home is the first divine institution. God created man. God created woman. And God's plan for marriage is one man for one woman for life. We find in this the first marriage ceremony when God brought the woman to the man. Thus the home was created. But you know, sadly in our world today, the home has been destroyed. And that's why society is where it's at. Because the home is not the way that God designed it to be. We find in Psalm 127 in verse 1 that unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. And so no doubt we must build our homes according to the pattern that God has given. Today our goal as we study through the Word of God is to see God's plan for the home, God's design for the home, but more specifically, God's design for the man to be the spiritual leader of the home. This sermon is entitled, The Call of Duty, God's Plan for Man. And so I hope we will open our Bibles together and examine what God says regarding who is to lead the family in those matters that are spiritual. We stay in the book of Genesis to find that the man is the head of the home, that he is the spiritual leader. In Genesis chapter 3, we find how sin entered the world. Eve heard a lie, believed a lie, and obeyed a lie. She gave in to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, 1 John 2, 16. She ate of that fruit that she was not to eat of, and she gave to her husband, and he ate. And so then we had the Lord coming to them, and in Genesis three fifteen we have the, the first prophecy about the coming Messiah, that Jesus would come and die on the cross uh, to deliver a crushing blow to the head of Satan. But in Genesis three sixteen we read this, to the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. So you see, it's God's plan for the man to be the leader. We fast forward to the New Testament, and we come to Paul's first letter to Timothy, his own son in the faith. And in 1 Timothy 2, 8, Paul says, I will that men pray everywhere, lifting holy hands. And then beginning in verse 11, he says this, Let a woman learn in silence with all submission. And I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. Here's the reasoning. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. And so we see then why the man is to be the leader. In 1 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse 2, it says, Paul says, I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ and the head of every woman is the man. And so again, this is God's plan, God's design for the man to be the leader in the home. In Colossians chapter 3, beginning in verse 18, we find this. Wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. 
Husbands, love your wives. Do not be bitter toward them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. There we see the home as a unit, don't we? We see the husband and wife relationship. We see uh, the relationship of parents to children and children to parents. But then notice that Paul specifies that fathers are the be, be the ones to teach their children to train them and not to provoke them. We look to Ephesians chapter 5 and as well as chapter 6 to find the counterpart, if you will, of the book of Colossians. They're known as uh, sister epistles or twin epistles because they're so similar. And so in Ephesians 5, beginning in verse 22, Paul paints this beautiful picture of Christ and the church. And he looks at the marriage relationship. And he says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is head of the church. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. What an awesome, awesome responsibility. And so there we see the wife and husband, the, the spouse relationship, but more importantly, the church of Christ and his relationship to his bride. And then we come into Ephesians chapter 6, and we have what very similar to what we found in Colossians 3, 18 through 21. But I want us, again, pertinent to our study of fathers being the leaders, to zero in on Ephesians 6 and verse 4. And you, fathers... Do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training or nurturing and admonition of the Lord. Do not provoke your children to wrath. It means do not be unfair. Do not be inconsistent. Do not be hypocritical. You tell your children to do these things, make sure you're doing them. Bring them up in the training of the Lord. This means to promote health, strength, and education. And while this is important physically, it's much more important spiritually. We are to use both instructive and corrective actions to train up our children in the way they should go. Proverbs 22, 6. But then notice this, bring them up in the admonition of the Lord. This phrase literally means a putting in the mind. We are to start with our children when they are very young to put in their mind about the one true God about his love, about his existence, about his, his mercy, about his goodness, about his severity. And so husbands, we notice from the word of God that we have a great, great responsibility. I'm privileged to be a husband and I'm privileged to be a father of four children. Twins are coming very soon, Lord willing. And what a great, heavy responsibility it is to make sure I lead my family because if I lose my family, I'll be a failure. I have a great responsibility. And husbands, fathers, godly men, if you're listening to this, you also have that heavy responsibility, that call of duty to step up and lead your families in the way they should go. You know, it's been said that a child's first image of their heavenly father is what they see in their earthly father. Isn't that strong? The image that they have of their heavenly father will first be seen in their earthly father. What image are we portraying for our children as they grow up and learn about the God of heaven? Someone also said, as the home goes, so goes society. But you know, we could also say, as the home goes, so goes the church. Men, if we're not doing our part at home to train our children, don't be surprised if they go in a way that we don't want them to go. We can't allow others to do that job. That is our responsibility to make sure we train them at home and to make sure we're stepping up because if we don't lead our families, the world will pick up the slack and the world will lead them into darkness. And so again, what a heavy, heavy task, a heavy responsibility we have. And husbands, fathers, men, it is high time for us to step up. It is high time for us to lead. And this coronavirus pandemic is forcing us to stay at home, isn't it? But that can be a blessing. You see, now we're able to gather our families. We're able to spend more time with them, quality time with them. We can open up the Word of God. We can sing praises to God together. We can lead our families. We can pray with them. We can pray for them. And they can look to us as we do our best to guide them to the perfect example of our Lord. Now, before we go any further, I want to make something very clear. 
In no way am I suggesting or insinuating that the woman's role is not important. The woman's role in the home, the role of the wife, the role of a godly mother is extremely important. Likewise, the role of the woman in the kingdom of God is extremely important. Where would we be in the kingdom without our godly women? Without our Bible class teachers, without the ones to make those calls, to make those visits, to write those cards, to make those meals. I am personally very thankful for the godly women in my life. For my wife, for my mother, for my mother's sisters, for my grandmother who has gone on to her reward. You know, if it weren't for them, I wouldn't have the training and discipline that that I needed. You see, my mother stepped up to fulfill that role of being a leader when I was young. She filled the role of the spiritual leader in my home. And why sometimes that's what you have to do if the husband is not fulfilling his role the way he should. Then you have to make sure that you are pledging your allegiance to Christ. You submit yourself to the Lord first. And by your example, you may lead him to the Lord. That's what we find in 1 Peter 3, 1 and 2. And so wives, women, you play an extremely important role. You know, I'm reminded of young Timothy. We mentioned Paul writing to Timothy, his own son of the faith. And Timothy, uh, Paul reminded Timothy, rather, uh, that his mother and his grandmother played an instrumental role in his spiritual well-being. That's what we find in 2 Timothy 1, 5, as well as 2 Timothy 3 and verse 15. And so wives, I'm going to say a quick word to you before we move on. This is a great opportunity for you to lead your husbands, if they are not Christians, to set the right example of faithfulness right now during this pandemic. You know, we're having to worship at home. But if you don't set the right example for them, what are they going to think? Oh, well, they're not really committed to the Lord like I thought. But if you make sure you're spending time in the Word and you're doing your part to lead your children and to set that right example for them, Again, according to 1 Peter 3, 1 and 2, you may even win them ultimately to the Lord. And so women, wives, you play an extremely important role in the home. And I do not want to belittle that. The Word of God certainly does not belittle that. But the thrust of this sermon is to men, godly men, husbands and fathers, that we will answer the call of duty to step up and to lead our families. You know, during this pandemic, as I've mentioned, we are to stay home meaning we are to worship at home. And some of you men, you may have never had to lead singing before. You may have never had to to lead public prayers, or or maybe you've never had to say the meditation for the Lord's Supper. You've never had to deliver a sermon. What a great opportunity. What a great responsibility to be able to step up and to lead your family in worship. But I want to say this, even though public assemblies have been canceled, worship has not been canceled. We still gather on the first day of the week in our homes to worship God in spirit and in truth. But husbands, fathers, men, if we don't lead our families in worship, who will? And so again, we have a great responsibility to step up and lead. Our goal today is to look at three examples from the Word of God to examine obedience, faithfulness, and leadership. And by looking into these three godly men, I hope that we will be encouraged to step up and answer the call of duty. In the first place, we want to consider Abraham. If you have your Bible still with you there, I invite you to Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18. We're going to spend a a good bit of time in the book of Genesis today, especially with our first two examples. But in Genesis chapter 18, you may recall uh, that God reiterates this uh, son of promise, which of course we know is Isaac. Going back to Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3, the seed promise was given to Abraham. In thy seed shall all families of the earth be blessed. Well, for that to happen, of course, Abraham had to have a son. And so this promise is reiterated. Here in this chapter, we read about Sarah. And you remember, she laughed. And of course, Isaac's name means laughter. And so we have that in this text. But beginning in verse 16, we have Abraham interceding for Sodom. And we remember what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah according to chapter 19. But I want you to notice something. Beginning in verse 16 of Genesis 18, again, we're thinking about Abraham who answered the call of duty to step up and lead his family. Then the men rose from there and looked toward Sodom, and Abraham went with them to send them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. Notice verse 19. For I have known him in order that he may command his children 
and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. What a powerful passage. What a powerful testimony to Abraham. God had confidence in Abraham to step up and lead his family. And so we want to examine this verse a little bit closer. Notice that he may command his children and command his household. Again, this charge given to the man to be the spiritual leader, to command his children, to, to command his household, to follow in his steps. And that's what we have in this phrase, after him, meaning after his example. He, he is to blaze the trail and the family is to fall in line. And of course, he is following example of the Lord. We have this phrase then, that or to this end for this purpose, that they keep the way of the Lord. Now remember in this time uh, that Abraham would have faced much difficulty because this was a world of idolatry. And you remember his family came from idolatrous practices, but now he's having to leave or, or lead his family rather into the way they should go. He has to step up and to lead his family to make sure they know the one true God of heaven. We make the application today. Look at the world in which we live and how difficult of a task it is to lead our families when there's the God of money, the God of technology, all these different idol gods in the world today. But we have to do our part and make sure we lead our families to the one true God of heaven. Notice, to do righteousness. We find in Psalm 119 and verse 172 that all of God's commandments are righteousness. And then in 1 John 3 and verse 7, it says that do not be deceived. He who does righteousness is righteous. But husbands, fathers, men, I want to ask you something. How can we lead our families in the way of righteousness if we are not keeping the commandments of God? How can we teach our children to follow in the steps of the Lord if we are not following his example? And so Abraham serves as this, this great example who led his family to the Lord. He led them to do righteousness, to do justice, to understand the difference between good and evil, to understand the consequences of doing what is right, but also the consequences of doing what is wrong. And so you see, fathers, husbands, godly men, we have a charge, we have a responsibility, we have a call to duty, a call to answer, to make sure we're leading our families in the way they should go. Notice this last phrase, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. Again, from the context, we know of this seed promise back to Genesis 12, 3. But man, God will bless us if we lead our families. Our children will rise up and we can watch them as they walk in the Lord. And I know for me, that, that's my goal, to lead my wife to heaven and to lead my children to heaven. But if I'm not doing the right thing and I lose my soul, what will it matter? I have to make sure that I'm doing my best to lead them in the way they should go. And so we've noticed Abraham who answered the call of duty. In the second place, let's consider the example of Noah. Stay with me in the book of Genesis. Go back with me to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6, and you remember in this chapter what's taking place. Here's the world overthrown in wickedness. Now in Genesis 6, 5, it says that the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But then notice verse 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. You know, there are some who say, you can't find grace in the Old Testament. We found it right there, didn't we? And we see the goodness and severity of God in this passage. It's, it's his justice. It's his righteous vengeance that he's going to take on the world because of sin. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Have you ever wondered why he found grace in the eyes of the Lord? Notice verse 9. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations, Noah walked with God. You think about Abraham, our first example. He walked with God, didn't he? And God knew him. Abraham was a friend of God. It was counted unto Abraham unto righteousness. 
Abraham staggered not at the promise. Abraham had this integrity about him, this this character of a godly leader. So did Noah. And God was able to see that. And so Noah was able to step up. He walked with God. He he did all that God had commanded him to do, Genesis 6.22. That's why he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Yes, it's unmerited favor. We can never do anything to deserve or earn the grace of God, but there are conditions that we are to meet if we want to be beneficiaries of His grace. But then notice this in verse 10. And Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. We find in verse 10 that Noah was a father. That Noah was a leader of the family. And that he had a responsibility, regardless of the chaos going on in the world, that he had to lead his family into the one location for salvation. And of course, in this text, it is the ark. And God commanded Noah to build this ark. And we read that Noah obeyed. He did exactly what God said to do. In Hebrews eleven seven, it says, By faith Noah moved with fear, and he built an ark to the saving of his household. Notice that. He led the way. He stayed faithful to God. Over a hundred years preaching, the flood's coming. And all these people mocking him, his sons are watching that. His sons are are beholding his steadfastness. His sons are listening to him say, we're going to listen to God. We're going to do what God says to do. And in the end, they could trust him and lead or or follow his example as Noah was a godly leader. Notice he built that ark to the saving of his household. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, we read that eight souls were saved by water. No doubt Noah and his family were those eight souls. And if Noah wouldn't have stepped up to lead, and if he wouldn't have remained faithful to the Lord, his family would have been lost in that flood with all the others. But you see, the water elevated them above the wickedness to higher ground. And in verse 21, it says that baptism does now also save us. Here's a side note. Baptism into Christ saves us as our sins are washed away by the blood of Christ. Acts 22, 16, Romans 6, 3 through 6. Now, we are not called to build an ark, are we? God hasn't called us to build an ark, but God has called us to lead our families in the right way. And so men, husbands, fathers, we've learned from Abraham and Noah that even though they faced difficult times and difficult circumstances, they had to lead their families, and they did so. But that brings us to our third and final example, and that is the example of Joshua. So I invite you to Joshua chapter 1, And verse 1, Joshua chapter 1 and verse 1. And while you're turning there, just a few thoughts about Joshua. We find in Exodus 24 and verse 13 that Joshua was an assistant of Moses. And of course, Moses was one of the greatest leaders of all time. And so Joshua was able to see what Moses went through as a leader. But no doubt he could prepare himself. In Deuteronomy chapter 3 and verse 28, God commands Joshua Uh, or Moses rather, to command Joshua and encourage him and strengthen him because he's going to be the next leader. In Deuteronomy chapter 31, verses 7 and 14, Joshua is called by Moses, ultimately by God, to step up and lead. And that brings us to Joshua 1, verses 1 and 2. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am given to them, the children of Israel. God is telling Joshua, Joshua, it's time to step up and lead. Now's your time. Now's your opportunity. You've been preparing your mind and your heart for this. Now's the time. And then we read through chapter one how God says, You be strong and very courageous. I'm with you. You be strong. You be very courageous. I am with you. And dear friends, that's the same God we serve today. As we lead our families, God is with us. As we do it according to the way that he's instructed in his word, he is with us. And so we come to Joshua chapter 24 and verse 15. And this is one of my favorite passages. I'm sure it's one of yours as well. It serves as a great bookend to the book of Joshua. You know, God told Joshua, I'm going to be with you. And as we read through the book of Joshua, we see it's a book of conquests. We see God's people flourishing, and Joshua's the leader. 
And then Joshua 24, 15, we read this. Joshua stands up and he says, Choose you this day whom you will serve. You're going to serve the gods of your fathers or the god of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Brethren and friends, how much better would our world be? How much stronger would our society be if every man would come out in front of his family and say, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And it is my prayer that we will make that same statement and that we'll mean it and that we'll lead our families in the way they should go. And so today we've noticed these three examples of these godly men, these godly leaders who answered the call of duty. I close by asking you, will you answer the call? I know this is a difficult time. I know this is a challenging time and and we're having to step out of our comfort zones. But I hope this will encourage you to remember that God is with us as we lead our families. Let's just make sure that we're walking in the right way, setting the right example so our wives and our children can look to us and we can guide them in the way they should go. Husbands, are we cherishing our wives? Are we loving our wives as Christ loves the church? Do our children see us loving our wives? Do they see us appreciating our wives? You know, that's how they're going to learn to treat their spouse one day. Are we setting the right example? Fathers, are we teaching our children how to pray? Do they come in at night and and they see us knelt, uh, knelt down by the bed praying to God? Do they hear us singing praises to God throughout the day? Are we teaching them to pray? Are we teaching them to fear God and keep His commandments? If we don't step up and lead, who will? Again, we have that responsibility. Men, I hope that we have taken these matters into our hearts. And I hope that we will apply them to our lives. And it may be the case you're listening today and you're not a Christian. You're not a man of God. Think about the call of duty that you have. Jesus Christ came and died on the cross for you. He set the perfect example to follow He said, if any man come after me, let him take up his cross, deny himself daily and follow me, Luke 9, 23. What a great responsibility, what a great privilege and opportunity we have to follow in the steps of the Savior who will lead us all the way home. So it may be your call of duty is to obey the gospel of Christ. And I pray that if you haven't done that, that you will study your Bible, study the New Testament to see what you must do to be saved. And if we could ever study with you, we would love that opportunity. Dear friends, may we all, whatever our role may be, make sure we answer the call of duty. God bless you.